The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a man called Ken talking on the phone to a friend called Liz about holiday accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello? Hi Liz, it's Ken here. Hi Ken, nice to hear from you. Are you... This is just a quick call. But Mary and I have just been talking about our summer holiday. We haven't booked a place yet, and we've left it a bit late. We were just wondering if you know of any holiday rentals in your area. It's so nice there. Well, yes. I can think of two or three places that are very nice. What dates have you got in mind? The 10th of July to the 22nd of July. Oh, yes. That is quite soon, isn't it? Well, there's a place near here called Moonfleet. Is that M -O, o N F L E E T? That's right. It's quite a rural location, and it's next to the owner's house, but it's got fields all around it, so it's very pretty. Hmm, sounds okay. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Well, it's an annex to the owner's house, and it's an apartment with two bedrooms, and an open-plan living area. Well, I like the sound of it. Is there anything we might not like about it? Well, it's quite a distance from the nearest shops, that's all. OK. And... Well, I'll tell Mary, but I don't think she'd mind that. Do you know how you book it? You have to book on the internet. There's a web address. It's www.summerhouses. One word? Yes. Then dot com. You'll be able to look at a photograph on that. OK. And what about the others? Where are they? The second one I'm thinking of is called Kingfisher, and that's even more rural. It's a really beautiful location, in fact. It's by the river, and it's got nice views. It overlooks woodland on the other side. Is that an apartment? No, it's a three-bedroomed house, and that's got a dining room, as well as a separate living room and a kitchen. But I expect it's more expensive. You'll have to check the prices. Hmm. It's probably a bit bigger than we need. But our nephew might be joining us. We're not sure yet. How do you book Kingfisher? You have to phone the owner directly. Shall I give you the number? I've got it here in my phone book. It's 01752 669 218. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And you mentioned a third place? Yes, there's a house that my sister stayed in last year. It's called Sunnybanks. Nice name. And the location of that one is rather different. It's in the centre of a village, but it's a very small and quaint place. Did your sister like it? Oh, yes. It's by the sea, so her children really loved it. What's the accommodation like? I'm not sure about the number of rooms, because I haven't been in it myself, but I think she said it's quite spacious, and I know it's got its own garden. It's not very big, but it's not shared with anyone else, and it's supposed to be very pretty. Any snags? Problems? The only other thing I can think of is that there's nowhere for parking. The streets are too narrow, 
So you have to leave your car somewhere else and then walk to the house. It's only about ten minutes away, but... OK. Well, I don't think it matters personally. How do you book it? There's an agent you have to contact. I don't know his details, but I can ask my sister and let you know tomorrow. Thanks, Liz. That'd be great. I'll talk to Mary and see what she says. Thanks for your help. That's OK, Ken. I'll speak to you again tomorrow. I hope you find what you're looking for. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Zoe goes to talk to her academic advisor. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. How are you getting on, Zoe? Feeling at home yet? Mm, well, more or less. There are still some things I need to buy, and I haven't found my way to all the facilities yet. But I really love the campus, and I've already made a few friends. Fantastic. Now let's see what we can do to get your studies off to the right start too. You're on the foundation course, so you can take up to eight modules. What we advise is that you take four modules in the first semester and, assuming everything goes well, four in the second. Have you decided which you want to take in this semester? I haven't made my mind up yet. I can't decide whether to take Principles of Marketing or Introduction to International Trade. Well, that depends on your career goal. You're planning to work in the biotechnology sector, aren't you? Uh, well, that's my present thinking, but I guess I might change my mind. Right, well, marketing is a broad general subject that you will find really useful in a number of careers. International trade, on the other hand, is more specific. That's fine if you're sure it's the sort of work you want to do. A lot of students start off thinking about that option because it seems glamorous, but marketing can also be an exciting career and there's a wide choice of jobs. Maybe you ought to wait until your career ideas are a bit more definite before you go down that road. Yes, I see. I could take international trade next year, couldn't I? Sure. You could do international finance as well. So, in your first semester, you've got principles of marketing, Introduction to Economics, Banking and Finance, and, let's see, Principles of Financial Accounting. How do you feel about that as a package? It's OK, I think. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. But I'm a bit worried about the maths. There'll be some statistics to do, won't there? Basic statistics, yes. But nothing more difficult than your last year of school maths. I know, but our maths syllabus was a bit old-fashioned. Mostly algebra, geometry, trigonometry and stuff. Hardly any stats. Right, well, it sounds as if you could do with the maths brush-up course. Can I arrange for you to attend just the classes on statistics, if you like? That'd be great. I didn't want to do the whole of maths again, but the stats classes would make me feel much more confident, thanks. 
Hang on a minute. There's one more thing. Your English. Now you know you have to reach a satisfactory standard in English by the end of your first year to be allowed to go on to the main BSc course. Yeah. Now I'm in an English-speaking environment, and I have to speak English all the time. I'm sure I'll be all right. It certainly helps, but speaking isn't everything. You'll have to get your reading up to the standards where you can understand the books on your course reading list quickly. To get the information and ideas, you need to write your essays. That means you have to develop a high level of comprehension skills. You'll never get through the course material. If you try to read the books intensively from cover to cover, that's why our language skills development program gives you a series of graded academic texts to study and answer questions on a limited time. You'll probably find it hard at first, having to work against the clock without a dictionary. How can I improve my skimming and scanning skills? Good question. For that, you'll have to do a range of specially designed exercises. Sometimes these will be from a transparency because it is often how the lecture material is presented. Sometimes I think I'll never learn all the vocabulary. English is such an enormous language. I know what you mean. English is the biggest language ever. At least three hundred and fifty thousand words. Even Winston Churchill only knew sixty thousand, so they say. But as an academic student, you can get a lot of help from the academic word list by Avril Coxhead. Of Victoria University, that's in Wellington, New Zealand. I've studied word lists, of course, but how does this one help? The academic word list is based on a survey of three and a half million words of academic text. It contains five hundred and seventy families of the words most commonly found in academic texts. Well, that's apart from the two thousand most useful words in English. They come in a separate list. You can see copies of both in the library. You said word families. Do you mean words that are similar? In a way, yes. It means that all the different grammatical forms of a word are listed together, so you can see the nouns, verbs, adjectives, forms with prefixes and suffixes, and so forth. It'll be clearer when you look at it. Anyway, Avril Coxhead gives you really great hints about how to learn the words, so it shouldn't be too daunting. The trouble is, I tend to forget the words I learn. Well, there are two ways you can tackle that. First, always try to learn the words in a context. Either learn a whole sentence using a word, or learn a phrase that the word typically comes in. We call phrases like that collocations. That's a new one on me. Collocations. I'd better make a note of it. You do that. You can find collocations in most modern dictionaries. Anyway, as I was saying, there's a second study aid I recommend for vocabulary learning. When you get an assignment. Take a sheet of paper and write four headings: words I can use, words I can recognise but can't use, words I'm not sure of, words I don't know. Don't bother with the simple words, of course. Then go back after two weeks and look at the list again. Can you move any of the words into a better column? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. 
The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. In the 8th century, the Chinese invented paper and woodblock printing. Remember that up to this time, very few people could read and write, and so only a very small number of people could understand written history. Suddenly, many books appeared, and many more people learnt to read. In the 14th century, the first printing press was invented in Germany. This reduced how long it took to produce books. The new printing technique quickly spread to other parts of the world. More books appeared, and even more people learnt to read. The first printed newspaper appeared in 1605, and the first daily newspaper in 1702. Now, people could read news stories soon after the event happened, and every event was recorded and stored. The problem with newspaper history is that newspaper reporters could tell the stories they wanted to tell, and not necessarily the truth. Photography was the next important development. We generally agree that photography was born in 1839. Some of the earliest photographs that the public saw were images of the American Civil War. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. People were shocked by the photographs of dead soldiers and for the first time saw the reality of war. By 1850, photographs appeared regularly in newspapers and people now expected the truth. At the end of the 19th century came the first motion picture camera. Soon, history was being recorded as moving images. In the 1930s, television brought moving images into people's homes. More and more people saw history as it happened, and more and more history was recorded. Today, of course, we expect that every event in the world is recorded. Satellite TV and the internet allow people to watch any event anywhere in the world, as it happens. It doesn't matter if the TV cameras are not there. People carry around mobile phones and can record any incident and then share it online. Families have their own video cameras and record their own history. Children now grow up watching their parents and grandparents on film. I'm sure you'll agree that the transition from storytelling to what we have today has been dramatic. And I hope that... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about the pitfalls and pleasures of being a postgraduate student. Look at questions 32 to 37.
Postgraduates are about as easy to define as catching steam in a bucket. Courses can be vocational, for training, as research, as a preparation for research, or a combination of these. Also, you can choose between full-time and part-time. Increasingly, the approach to postgraduate study is becoming modular. The vast majority of postgraduates are doing short, taught courses, many of which provide specific vocational training. Indeed, there has been a 400% increase in postgraduate numbers in Britain over the past 20 years. Current figures stand at just under 400,000. People undertake postgraduate study for many reasons. These may be academic, intellectual challenge, development of knowledge, vocational, training for a specific career goal, or only vague, drifting into further study. It is essential that you determine the reasons you want to become a postgraduate. If you have clear goals and reasons for studying, this will enhance your learning experience and help you to remain focused and motivated throughout your course. Where you study should be based on much more than the course you want to do. For some courses, you're likely to be there for several years, and it is important that you are happy living there. Check also what type of accommodation is available and whether the institution provides any housing specifically for postgraduates. Choosing an institution and department is a difficult process. To determine quality, do not rely on the reputation of an institution, but find out what the ratings are from the most recent assessment exercises. Find out about the staff, their reputation, competence, enthusiasm and friendliness. Visit the department if possible and talk to existing postgraduates about their experience, satisfaction, comments and complaints. Be very careful to check how they feel about their supervisors. Also, check what facilities are available, both at an institutional level, for example libraries, laboratory and computing facilities, and in the department, for example study room, desk, photocopying, secretarial support, etc. Everyone will have their own priorities here. I am always anxious to check the computer support available and regard it as slightly more important than library access. Your working environment and the support available to you plays an essential part in making your work as a postgraduate a positive experience. Life as a postgraduate can be very different to your other experiences of education. Things that can distinguish your experience are the level of study, independence of working, intensity of the course, the demands on your time, and often the fact that you're older than the majority of students. These factors can contribute to making you feel isolated. However, there are several ways you can make sure that this is either short-lived or does not happen at all. Many student unions have postgraduate societies that organize social events and may also provide representation for postgraduates to both the student union and the institution. Departments can also help to create a sense of identity and community and often have discussion groups available. Don't be afraid to talk to staff about any difficulties you might be having. Of course universities provide counseling services but we have found that the best advice comes from talking to other postgraduates who may have faced similar difficulties. Look at questions 38 to 40. Financial planning is essential since the government excludes postgraduates from student loans and it can be difficult to maintain your student status with banks. This has implications for free banking and overdraft facilities. Do not underestimate your living costs including food, accommodation and travel and be careful not to budget for everything except a social life. Funding a course 
is one of the most challenging things people face when considering postgraduate study. Most postgraduate students finance themselves. They pay often very large fees to the institution and receive no maintenance income to support their study. Make sure you know exactly what your costs will be. Institutions often hide extra fees, like laboratory costs, behind the headline fee rate advertised. Funding can come from various sources – research councils, charities, trust funds, institutional scholarships, local education authorities, and professional bodies and organisations all offer various levels of funding. As I said before, the government excludes postgraduates from student loans, so it is essential you look to other sources. Career development loans are available from high street banks. The best advice on funding is to be proactive, persistent and patient. The postgraduate community in Britain is multinational, has a wide range of experience of life and work and an exciting mix of goals, both career and academic. Being a postgraduate student should be a productive and fulfilling thing to do and you will become part of a diverse and motivated social group. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.